Good morning, Good morning and welcome. I have a few announcements to make. One is to remind you that the Memorial Day Parade and Observance will start tomorrow at one o'clock. The parade starts in front of the fire station in church and the observance will follow once the uh, marchers get to the uh, site where we'll be doing the observances. Um, today is the last uh, production production of Lady Windermere's Fan. Uh, it's a play by Oscar Wilde that is being presented at the Hampshire Regional High School. And our sound technician, Emily Connell, has a major role in it. So it should be fun. It is funny. It's entertaining. And we're looking for hoping if you can get there, you can do have a really good time. Uh, Wellies Walkers will be 
sponsoring a uh, loaded potato and Sunday meal after church next Sunday to support Cancer Connection. And Kathy Adams would like to have a few words to set, talk about what this is about. Marcy just sort of said it all right now. Next week, we're hoping to see you all at our Welly Blockers fundraiser for Cancer Connection, which is always well attended. And we look forward to seeing you all there and bring your checkbook. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the deacons will be meeting Friday at 1030 here at the church. Is there anything else to come before us this morning? It's a matter of church concern. Well, let us begin our worship with our choral intro. Let us set aside this Sabbath as a most special day. This is a day to rest our tired bodies and refresh our weary minds. This is a day to renew our sagging spirits and to pull together our scattered lives. Let us celebrate this Sabbath day and offer our praise to God for God's creative and providential power and for God's grace and loving kindness. Let us give thanks and praise for all the many awesome blessings and generous mercies we receive daily. Now let us worship God as we gather together in song, singing Morning is Broken, number 53. invocation. Gracious God, who weakens the proud and strengthens the meek, awaken us to the glory of faithful obedience to you and humble service to humanity. As we search our heritage for traces of your revelation, grant us clarity of vision, lest we find it where it is absent and deny it where it is present. Let us resolve 
not only to claim your revelation as a legacy for your people, but also refine it as a legacy to your people. So we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Our Psalter reading for this morning is from Psalm 47, God's rule over the nations. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For the God is King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is King over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of peoples gather as the people of God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. God is highly exalted. Then we should love all men. 
Listen now to a reading from Hebrew scripture, which is our text. It's from 1 Kings 2, beginning at the first verse. When David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord God will establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness and with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you as successor to your throne. your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears, though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. I 
Let us be in prayer. O oh God, our source of meaning of life and our hope of victory and death, we bow in gratitude for the ties with which you bind us to those who have gone before us. We are especially grateful for the assurance that at the end of their journey with us does not spell the end of, our, of their journey with you, that their service to you is not limited to the time of their earthly pilgrimage, that their influence is not buried with them, that in ways that they would have guessed, never guessed, and we could never have planned, they continue to guide us, helping us to resist the temptation to do evil and quickening our will to do good. Just as we are strangely and wonderfully made in your image, we are strangely and wonderfully linked to them across the generations. For all this, we thank you, God, as we remember and honor those who died in the service of our country, those who gave their lives to preserve and forward the best ideals and freedoms of our country, we humbly acknowledge the legacy they have given us. And we are challenged in our day and age to determine what kind of legacy we will leave for the generations to come. What kind of legacy will you lead us to grow and gift the future? This week, we were shocked by the massacre of 19 fourth graders in Texas, a state that has no restriction on gun ownership and type of guns or ammunition. We mourn when, with and pray for the families who are dealing with the unthinkable tragedy. We pray for all the children who had to experience it and for all the first responders who have nightmares because of it. And we pray for all students and teachers and families who live with the fear of the loss of a classroom as being a safe place. But we need to do more than pray. We ask for your spirit to work with us to help those in power to recognize that all these shootings are a public health issue, not a rights issue that needs to be addressed. You have promised us peace in your realm. Help us make peace in our realm. Keep us from being overwhelmed and numbed by the tr terrible onslaught of violence in our country and in the world around us. Oh God, be in our prayers for all those who suffer this day, for all those who live in fear, for all those who grieve, for all those who hunger and thirst, for all those who work for peace and justice, as we pray our personal prayers in the quiet of this warm moment. Let us now, oh God, we in our, be, yeah, let us now pray the prayer that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing together the hymn, In the Bulb There is a Flower, number 683.
winds of spring that waits to be long revealed until the season something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time eternity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death the resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until it sees. Son, something God alone can see. The Indianapolis 500, the 106th version of it, will be run today. The first race ran in 1901, and it has been a Memorial Day feature ever since, except for some wartime years during which gasoline and rubber were rationed, and it's felt unwise to have those cars racing 500 miles. As you might imagine, a race like this has produced many memorable moments. You may recall A.J. Floyd's fourth win in 1977, or Janet Guthrie as the race's first female driver that year, or Tom Sneva breaking the 200 mile per hour barrier, or Danica Patrick's fourth place win in 2005. But perhaps the most memorable or at least inspiring indie event happened during the second running at the, big book, the Brickyard in 1912. Something happened in that race that caught the public's imagination and helped make the Indianapolis 500 the expected and great race that it is today. What happened didn't even include the winner. The pace setter at that race set a blistering tempo. One driver, Ralph De Palma, immediately took the lead and led the pack for 198 laps breaking every existing Speedway record for 450 miles. And victory was within his grasp. And he had an eight lap lead. De Palma was sure to be a winner. Accounts differ to what happened next. Some say that he developed an oil leak. Others report that his Mercedes threw a piston. In any event, the car came to a dead stop on the backstretch and the fortune he had been assured vanished into thin air with a less than a mile to go. Undaunted, De Palma, De, De Palma and his mechanic, Rupert Jenkins, climbed out of the car and pushed it over a mile until they managed to shove it over the finish line. However, as they were pushing the car, Joe Dawson passed them to win the race. De Palma was disqualified, because the car wasn't under its own steam, I guess, but it didn't matter. The crowd gave him a standing ovation, a long standing ovation. And the story of De Palma and Jeffkins pushing their car across the finish line captured the fancy of people all over the world. They crossed the finish line, and the rest is history, as the Indianapolis 500 became then a deep American tradition. This weekend, and particularly tomorrow, we remember those who crossed the finish line, or more to the point, who were involuntarily pushed across the finish line during the time of war. Although the intent of this holiday, which was first proclaimed in 1868,
when flowers were placed on the graves of both Union and Confederate soldiers in the Arlington National Cemetery on May 30th was to honor the military dead. The weekend has also become a time when we remember all our loved ones who have passed on, or in the words of David in our reading, who have gone before us have gone the way of the earth. What I propose for us to consider is what those who have fallen would say to us if they should rise from the grave, even for a few minutes. Now it's no zo movie, zombie movement moment. It's just a question. What would their advice be? What perspective would they share with us? Of course, the answers would vary and be highly speculative, but our scripture reading today gives the advice of someone who knew he was about to pass beyond the veil. King David was dying. He knew he was dying. And then he said, I'm about to go the way of the earth. David took this moment as an opportunity to give his son Solomon some good advice. And it was fourfold, as we heard. Be strong. Be courageous. Be faithful. Take care of business. Be strong. Be strong. Ralph De Palma could not have imagined that to finish the Indy 500, he would have to get out of his Mercedes and push a dead weight of nuts and bolts, sheet metal, pistons, struts, and tires a mile to get across the finish line. The car was supposed to provide forward power on its own. That was the whole idea of this invention. And it was only 14 years old. It was an automobile. It was self-propelled. This is how we often approach life, isn't it? We expect life to carry us along. We see life as a stream upon which we flow and we go. We assume that life carries us. We don't carry life. How surprised we are when sometimes things break down and we have to climb out of our expectations, clamber over our dreams, and step into rough pothole road, road of experience and start pushing. Be strong, David advises his son Solomon. The counsel to be strong comes to those who are about to assume positions of leadership, places of power and responsibility. Leadership takes strength. It's not for the faint of heart. But leadership is for everyone because at some level, each one of us is a leader. Our sphere of influence may be in the home where we're raising the next generation. It may be in the community where we volunteer to make, and to make a small part of the world a much better place. It may be in the office or at the job or at school or in church. And yes, all of us are in positions, some great, some small, of leadership. And leadership requires strength, which is another way of saying that it requires resolve. It requires character. It requires certainty. It requires integrity. It requires the ability to listen. It requires the willingness to admit mistakes. It requires believing in something. Such a person is a strong person and a leader. Be courageous. Can you imagine how De Palma felt when his car came to a grinding halt in that racetrack? He was leading the race eight laps out in front. He was not just a lame duck, he was now a dead duck. No ways around it. How did the crowd respond when they saw him pushing the car? Did they laugh? Did they point their fingers at him? We don't know. But we do know is that when he crossed the finish line, they erupted in a thunderous ovation. The guy showed real courage. So David's word to his son is, have courage. You know, we live in a risk-adverse culture. As someone said, we dress our kids like knights in armor, knee pads, helmets, and goggles just to go bicycling. Our job seems to be to keep everyone safe. David says to his son, be courageous. He did not say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because, as Mark Twain put it later, courage is not the absence of fear. It's acting in spite of us. Our first responders know this very well. 
David's advice is couched in the imperative mood, mode. Be strong, be courageous. It is a choice. You don't say, don't say you can't be strong, don't say you can't be courageous, just do it. So De Palma gets behind the Mercedes and starts to push that hunk of metal, even though the crowd may have been making fun of him, even though there was absolutely no chance for him to win the race, he just did it. Be faithful. David's last words of advice to his son was keep, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies. Be strong and being courageous without being faithful to the word of God means that our strength and our courage is likely to be misplaced or to come as something that is too little or too late. Even though we can't know this for sure, De Palma and his mechanic may have been wise to pay more attention to the car's manual in preparing and up, the, the upkeep of the car. Although, to be fair, the stress of a 500 mile race on a car of that vintage was enormous. And in this, the second race of its kind, it was still a whole lot to learn. So David's point to his son is that strength and courage should be fortified by the word of God. David had some unfinished business, some loose ends to tie up that are listed graphically in the, in the rest of that reading from Second, well, from uh, First Kings 2. De Palma also had some unfinished business. He, as he went on to drive more than 4,000 miles in the Indy 500 races. And in 1915, he actually won the race, although with a bit of trickery. Ahead by two laps to go, a connecting rod went through the crank cast, crank case of his car. But the second place driver did not know this and failed to, to, ch to challenge De Palma, who ended up coasting to victory. He did set a speedway record of a blistering 89.84 miles per hour, which has stood for seven years. And he finished, reached the finish line successfully. David's advice to Solomon and our mandate as followers of Christ are not experienced in a poofy make-believe land of make-believe, but in the nitty-gritty, fast-paced, rapid cha rapidly changing world of unbelief hostility, and sometimes anger. It's a world in which an 18-year-old can purchase two assault weapons and a ton of ammunition and go into a school and kill 19, 10, 9 and 10-year-old children and two teachers. This was absolutely, actually no isolated event. There have been more than 200 shootings in our countries this year alone. 27 of them have involved K through 12 schools so far this year. Just think, over 200 shootings and we're not even halfway through the year. Our children and teachers have suffered and died. We need our nation desperately to deal with this public health issue. We need to ban as a nation the sale of weapons and ammunition. Weapons that the sole purpose is for killing a whole lot of people at one time. People say, well, this is the Second Amendment. Well, this is a federal issue because the Second Amendment is a federal rule. So this is where this action needs to take place. And I know, we know that states will not will balk at this and all that, but you know, they did that when with the drinking age, when federal government, the CDC said that students, people should not start drinking or be allowed to buy booze until they were 21. Some states balked at that, and what they did was they withheld the federal highway funds. And all of a sudden, all the states were on board. And we can also fund mental health programs in our schools and communities. I'd just like to have this image stick in your mind for today and maybe in weeks ahead. And that is basically when you see a boy beating another boy with a stick. 
The stick is not to blame, but you take the stick away from the boy. Yes, we can be and we need to be strong. Yes, we need and can be courageous. Yes, we need and can be faithful. Yes, we can take care of business so we may cross the finish line and leave a good and lasting legacy. Amen. Let us sing together the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, number 85. Now rise from your pew, your chair, your couch, and go forth to serve one another and be empowered by the love of God as you do so. Go forth in the company of all God's children to do God's work and work God's will as Jesus showed us on earth as it is in heaven so that in loving and serving others, whoever and wherever they may be, the peace of God's realm may come through you. Amen.